Welcome to Full Momentum and HEC Raz Vodcast. I am your host, Ben Carey, and we are here live at ASFPM 2022. It's our first in person vodcast recording, period. Definitely our first vodcast recording at a conference, Chris. Yeah. Uh, what are your thoughts so far about the conference? Well, it's very noisy, as you can <laughs> hear. There's a lot of action happening. People are walking by going, what the heck is this? We've never seen a, a podcast at a conference before. They're staring at us. But it's great because it's it's attracting people over here, and we're talking heck raz with lots of people that have come by and, and really told us about some very cool stuff. Um, tried to get a gentleman on here to talk about how he's automating heck raz and uh, he wasn't quite ready to come on, but that's okay. We'll he might be by tomorrow. Else. He might be maybe, by tomorrow. Maybe by tomorrow. And uh, we got to interview Mark Forrest a little bit earlier today. So that's going to be really awesome to uh, include, in, and you'll see that in the uh, podcast. So what do you think about the, the venue here, Ben? Yeah, you know, it's, it's cool energy. Obviously, I think with conferences just in the last year, there's a lot of energy around them because we're back in person, which is exciting. Yeah. For you and I, it's fun to be at a conference where like Raz is maybe not front and center, but pretty close to front and center in terms of like the topics that are oh, being yeah. discussed. You know, most of the conferences you and I go to, they're kind of more around maybe hydro work or things that aren't modeling right. related. Versus here, it's, it's a it's a central topic, so that's really fun. Um, I've just been kind of blown away by some of the presentations thus far and we have barely even kind of gotten into some of the real technical ones yet oh, but yeah. there's a lot of really really cool work going on uh, through FEMA in terms of just their overall pursuit to really improve the way that floodplains are mapped from a risk standpoint and that's obviously done using primarily AGC RAS and there are some big things coming down the pipe you know it's federal government so it'll probably be slower than we like but a lot of big things coming down the pipe in the next you know, five to 10 years that'll be exciting for people to see. Oh yeah, and I'm looking forward to the technical topics uh, coming up this week. Uh, there's a lot of really good ones that are on the uh, program schedule, so that's gonna be a lot of fun. And even these exhibit times every evening is gonna be a lot of fun because people are flocking over here to see the t-shirts. Yeah. The I am a heck raz, no, sorry. Why, yes, I do model. I'm a heck raz modeler. So these are flying out of the box here, and uh, we'll probably run out by the end of the conference. What do you think, Ben? That's okay. <laughs> so if we run out, yeah. that means we had a lot, a lot of good conversations about Raz. Learned a lot of cool stuff at the conference, and uh, yeah, we'll be checking in periodically with you all. Uh, obviously, the goal of this is mostly to conduct some interviews and get some ideas on what people are doing out there using Raz, not using Raz, just kind of all the work that's going on with floodplain management. So. Yeah, and if you can hear the background noise, you can tell it is crowded here. There's lots of people, so this is a lot of fun. And, uh, yeah, got a few more days left. And, uh, yeah, what do you think, Ben? Yeah, I just hope everybody enjoys the interviews. Uh, and definitely comment to s if there was any particular interview you enjoyed or if you want a follow-up interview with any of our guests. Hopefully uh, there's at least a couple. I know Mark we want to bring on for maybe a longer discussion on a technical topic. But if there's yeah, anybody else sure. you guys enjoy listening to, let us know, and uh, we can try to make it happen. All right. <laughs> cool. Well, we'll catch up with you a little bit later. Sounds good. Welcome to Full Momentum and HEC Raz Vodcast. I'm your host, Ben Carey, and we are live here from the 2022 ASFPM Conference in Orlando, Florida. Mm -hmm. And uh, here joining me as always, Chris Goodell, along with a very special guest. Chris, I'll let you introduce Mark. Yeah, hey, Ben. Thanks. And uh, we have Mark Forrest from HDR. Hey, Mark. And hold that mic up to your mouth, too. <laughs> yeah, so uh, Mark's here joining us in Orlando at the ASFPM conference. And super excited to talk to you, Mark, because you've got a wealth of knowledge that uh, is hard to compare to, especially <laughs> when it comes to HECRAS modeling and floodplains. So, Mark from HDR. How are you? I'm very good. Thank yeah. you for... for uh, what's, what's your title these days? Because it seems like it always changes every time <laughs> I look at your email subject line. Yeah, it's kind of morphed <laughs> over the over the, over the the years, but uh, my official title is Senior Business Class Leader for Dams, Levees, Civil Works um, 
for floodplain management and surface water modeling. So that's a yeah. mouthful. Essentially, I'm the practice leader for HDR's um, water practice for both surface water and floodplain management. All, all floodplain things H and H, right? All things H so and H and floodplain related. Mark is the guy to go to at uh, HDR if you need any kind of water stuff. Yeah. Done so yet. I'm curious, Mark. Um, I'm assuming you know Gary Bruner. I know Gary. They go Gary way back. Well. Yeah. Okay. In fact, so Mark yeah, Mark has known Gary longer than I have. So yeah. can you talk a little bit about your relationship with Gary? Because we've had Gary on the the podcast a few times. So you know, I think people that have listened to the show are, are familiar with Gary. So how do you guys know each other? Gary and I have um, communicated over the last thirty plus years. Probably, I used to be the chair of uh, the Floodplain Management Association's um, uh, professional development committee. Okay. And so we would arrange for trainings at the at our conferences, and I would uh, try to arm twist Gary into uh, providing a RAS update training for us at our conferences. Um, I got to know him a lot better as we were working on a Corps of Engineers flood control project, the Truckee River flood damage reduction oh, project. Oh, yeah, sure. And uh, we, we needed to uh, switch to version uh, 3 of RAS. Um, it was still a beta uh, in order to model the complex dynamics of the Truckee River. And so the uh, local sponsor paid me, and uh, the F Sacramento District paid Gary Bruner and HEC for um, the team and the RAS team to help us put together that model. So I spent about six months uh, traveling back and forth to HEC two to three days a week as okay. we built the model, calibrated it, worked through bug issues with version three, um, and, um, and, and ultimately calibrated the model to, to a ton of data from the 1997 event, which is still the event of record for the Truckee mm -hmm. River. And was Chris at HEC at that time or no? Y I think I remember you coming in once, Mark, and I was that hiding was in the back of a cubicle put, trying to put stable channel design into HECRAS, <laughs> and I probably was introduced to you at that point, but yeah. Could be. It was 2000, 2001 yep. time frame. Yep, yep, that's the time frame. Um, yeah, that's great. And the Truckee River was probably one of the models or one of the systems being modeled in RAS that really showcased the need for 2D, wouldn't you say? It did, and Gary and I had a lot of conversations about um, why isn't there an effort to, to incorporate 2D into RAS, and yeah. the discussion really focused around what were core's responsibilities between ERDIC and HEC, but the need was developing, and we talked about pros and cons of different approaches and some of the challenges we had with some of the tools that were out there that were proprietary, and mm -hmm. I think that kind of stimulated the discussion about moving forward with a two-dimensional model. Right, right. So I'm curious, Mark, um, you go way back doing floodplain studies. We're kind of at a crossroads right now, at least with hydraulic modeling, um, or we're, we're entering a new phase. How do you see 2D coming about? And talk a little bit about the committee you're on. Uh, with Gary Bruner and some others about how we're going to incorporate that into our floodplain mapping in the future. Yeah, two-dimensional modeling has really turned the floodplain mapping um, arena pretty much on its head um, <laughs> because it, all of the standards that were developed for the National Flood Insurance Program were developed in the 70s. We couldn't even have anticipated at that point in time. Yeah anything other than a steady flow 1D world. Right, right. And uh, both a combination of doing unsteady simulations as well as um, the two-dimensional um, types of simulations has really made it the regulations, challenge the regulations in a lot of different ways. Mm. Um, and, and the two-dimensional and everything, all the mapping standards are based, uh, have been based around the one-dimensional world and the assumption that your water surface is the same across the cross section mm -hmm. of the floodplain. Right. Um, Two-dimensional modeling really, really does show that the dynamics are a lot more complex than what 1D models tell us are they are. Um, so the whole concept of profiles, how to map the floodplains, how do you, how do you implement the standards and interpolate water surface elevations uh, between. Um, Right now, you do it between using a profile between cross sections, but with a yeah. two-dimensional model with bifurcated flow, that's not possible. Right. 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 Um, so the um, FEMA put together a committee to investigate how we would navigate that problem, and uh, it was the 2D IPT committee. Uh, the first go-around started at HEC 
um, the first few meetings were at HEC. Um, that developed the uh, standards for how you showed the information on the maps. Mm. It didn't get into the details of... There goes the beer cart. Uh, <laughs> yeah, there goes the beer cart. <laughs> I'll have to be following that here. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> so how, how, to, how to show the information on the, on the maps as well as... Um, um, so how do you de de develop the mapping standards? And those mapping standards came out in December of 2020 as a result of the work of the committee. The committee has now been... Um, re-energized recently in the last few months to now start working on developing the engineering standards for how you actually uh, do the modeling, um, particularly in how you do floodway modeling in a mm -hmm. two-dimensional environment, and, and try to make some decisions on the no-rise standard, uh, negative surcharges, um, how to deal with one or two cells that might exceed the surcharge requirement. Mm -hmm. Um, how do you how do you deal with because a two-dimensional model is going to tell you that if you stick a pencil in the water you're going to have a localized impact yeah yeah yep. um, so the no rise standard doesn't apply when you uh, do an all-cell approach right, right so do you do use um, an approach where you average across a cross-section those are the kinds of concepts that will be explored at this point and how do you start how do you define your starting point for a floodway. Yeah, uh, and I remember when that guidance came out in 2020, because I was—I think I was on one of the, the first presentations that you guys gave, kind of describing it, and it seemed like it was very high level, right? Like, hey, these are kind of the general ideas that we're recommending. These are approaches that you can take. But then I read recently there was 20, 2021, fall 2021, there was another release of that same, same uh, information and recommendations, and it seemed like it was a little bit more specific in terms of, um, you know, more specific ways to actually approach those problems and those issues that you identified. So it seems like they're kind of narrowing in um, a little bit on, on maybe a defined set of recommendations or approach. It seems like it. it, it it's still a work in progress. The, the standards that came out in December of 2020 um, were, were very focused on the mapping, how, what kind of information needs to be presented on the maps. And and when you have a two-dimensional bifurcated flow, um, try, without a profile, how do you interpolate a water surface for designing a finished floor or some feature in the floodplain? So how closely spaced might your water surface contours need to be when you've got um, very steep gradients in your floodplain? Um, so the standards are really focused on, on the, that kind of, of um, information to be presented on the map so it would allow the user to be able to cross properly interpolate the information. Mm -hmm. Now we're talking about the methods yeah. um, and realizing that there's going to be a lot of situations where the floodway concept really doesn't apply very well, it's particularly in bifurcated flow. Mm -hmm. So what do you do with that? How do you define a floodway in that kind of an environment? And using uh, test data sets that uh, the FEMA contractors have been developing, we're going to use some of our data sets um, to help inform the process as well, where we've got a highly bifurcated flow like the Tanana River up in Fairbanks, Alaska. Mm. It's almost like starting from scratch, but even almost worse because we've already got all of these maps developed and what do you do mm -hmm. as those change going forward with the new procedures the new methods well what i what was really interesting i was at a policy meeting today on uh risk map development as well as the engineering behind it and to your point chris what they were talking about is the challenge is not just 2d as well it's also incorporating updated precipitation yeah. um, these other challenges that we know make our models and our maps less accurate and how do we incorporate all of those things uh, into more or less a, a program that has been designed for 1D methodology? And what we had heard, which is really interesting, is that instead of trying to kind of fit a square peg into a round hole, is that they're really looking at potentially kind of overhauling the program uh, uh, as a yes. whole to incorporate all of these new aspects that everyone knows need to happen. Um, so that was really interesting to hear, too. I think we get, Chris and I specifically, get kind of hyper-focused on the 2D side of things. Sure. Uh, but there's well, so much else that goes into that and so much else that the communities need to be able to really, you know, have the information to, to protect their community from flood risk and whatnot. So. Yeah, it challenges the program in a number of ways. One is the unsteady solution as well is that we've always assumed that the impact of an encroachment is only hydraulic. And you're in, in a 1D steady flow world, you would only feel that encroachment at the location of the encroachment 
mm -hmm. an upstream of it. Mm -hmm. And what the two-dimensional model tells you is that you feel the effect of the encroachment at the encroachment upstream and downstream, mm -hmm. and the da downstream impact can extend for miles. Is that wow. does it come with some attenuation effects that are occurring from that encroachment? You, you, re you redirect that flow, and as a result of, re of redirecting it, it takes a while for that that uh, that change in the flow pattern to S propagate through the system back and, out. and yeah. begin to disperse back. Yeah, that's very it. interesting because yeah, we, we've always kind of modeled with the. Upstream concept that yeah, yeah, if you make a change, down, it's going to gonna affect something upstream. But now we see that's not necessarily the case. Not mm. the case at all. As we get more sophisticated with our modeling. Yes. So one question for you, Mark, to switch gears from RAS, which obviously you have a plethora of knowledge about, and I know Chris has a couple other questions for you on that front. But back to ASFPM, um, obviously that's where we're at today. Is there anything in particular about this conference that you know drew you here or has drawn you in the past? I don't know if you've attended one in the past. I've been attending the SFPM conferences for, for decades, okay. um, and I currently serve on the board of directors for the SFPM Foundation, um, so I attend um, every conference. Uh, last two years have been virtual, and so this one is the first one we've had um, in person again, and, and uh, we have a, a, a huge number, almost a record number of Registrants, so yeah, it's people really are successful. eager to come back. Did you have anything to do with picking this spot? Because this is one of the best venues I've ever yeah. been. At. <laughs> I mean, nope. I, I walked mean. into the hotel and there's like waterfalls coming off of, uh, you know, this big mountain <laughs> in the back of the hotel into a pool, and it's yeah, it's pretty spectacular. It's here. an awesome venue for yeah. sure. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a lot of fun. I I really want to go down that water slide but i'm not sure i'm up for it <laughs> they may not let you either i think they're only letting oh. the, the smaller people do okay that. good then i don't have to feel the pressure of going down <laughs> so if, if there are engineers or modelers that are maybe have thought about coming to asfpm in the past haven't done it yet what would you tell them in terms of this the biggest value that you get from coming to this conference oh there's just such a wealth of information from policy related issues to technical um, the challenge oftentimes is there's so many breakout sessions that you have a hard time finding the, uh, going out to everything that you want to go to because yeah. there's overlapping content that will be of interest. Um, so you, you, they wear me out because there's just so much to do uh, for mm -hmm. the entire week from the workshops that begin on Saturday to the, to the breakout sessions and concurrent sessions that happen in the midweek, um, committee meetings, uh, region updates from each of the region, uh, FEMA regions on what's going on from a policy perspective. So if you're interested in both technical policy and um, mapping standards, um, it's all there. Uh, just a tremendous amount of information, as you can see from the exhibit booths. So, Mark, uh, before we let you go, I appreciate you coming on the, the yeah, podcast. Thank you, Mark. And I uh, want to know, welcome. besides the business side of things here, do you have anything fun planned while you're in Orlando? <laughs> My wife and I spent some time at uh, Disney World already. Oh wow! Uh, we okay, came early cool. To uh, do, to spend some some uh, some fun time before the conference nice. started. So nice. And, yeah. Uh, and I went to dinner with a, an old high school friend, that, or actually grade school friend that I've known for fifty years. Oh wow! Okay. So yeah, we've had a good time. So you brought up Disney World. What is uh, if Mark Force is going to ride one ride at Disney World? What are you riding? Space Mountain. Okay. <laughs> uh, I'm with you on that, yeah. I love Space Mountain. It's uh, very insane. And, you know, because it's dark, you can't see anything. You don't know when the turns are coming, so you can't prepare for it. You get a headache, though, sometimes. A little I've jarring. Yeah. For, yeah. for the engineer nerds out there, you guys both might get a kick out of this. Have you ever seen a, a picture or a video of Space Mountain with the lights on? No. Uh, it is amazing like from an, an engineering oh, standpoint. No, I've not seen that. You can yeah. see how tight all the turns are, and yeah. it's a very condensed space that is everything in. So if you're yeah. a structural engineer out there, <laughs> look up Space Mountain with the lights on. It is pretty, pretty cool. Very cool. Yeah. Very cool. Well, hey, thanks, Mark. You're welcome. Appreciate you joining. This was a lot of fun. Thanks for inviting and, me. And uh, a wealth of knowledge. And we do want to get you back on in a regular podcast and actually yes. talk a little bit more Raz and maybe even do uh, a technical bring up the topic. Software. Yeah. 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 Yeah, that'd be great. So. All right. Before we take off, Mark, anything you want to plug that you, HDR, ASFPM are kind of doing in the near future here? Um, Besides oh, hiring everybody. <laughs> <laughs> There's so many things to plug. The, the foundation is doing some great things. We've got a scholarship program. We're going to add another student to our scholarship program. Um, so if anybody's interested in the activities of the foundation, we're going to take on urban flooding. 
uh, as an initiative. Um, so there's a ton of things just going on that I think are great for our industry. So mm. it's, it's a fun thing to participate in. Fantastic. Yeah. And, that's and I appreciate your podcast. I've watched most of your episodes. Oh, cool. I think you guys cool. do a great job of communicating uh, RAS related topics to uh, to the users out there, and I know they all appreciate it. Yeah. All right. As do I. Well, that's awesome to hear, Mark. Thanks. Yeah. Well, Ben, Thank why don't you carry us home? Okay. Thank you again, Mark. And uh, yeah, this has been Full Momentum and HEC RAS Vodcast interview number one. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Mark. All right. All right, welcome to Full Momentum and HEC RAS Vodcast. Uh, I'm your host, Ben Carey. we got another interview here. Chris, I'll let you introduce Andy for us today. Thank you, Ben. So here we've got uh, Andy Young from Walter P. Moore Associates yep. in Houston, Texas, right? But you've got right. offices all over the place, right? Yeah, we've got about uh, 26 offices worldwide. And yeah. I'm in the Woodlands, which is just north of Houston. So. Yeah, very okay. cool. So I've known Andy for a long time. Uh, bump into him at uh, when I go down to Houston. And uh, we've worked on some projects together. Um, but Andy, what I'm interested to hear from you is what are the things you guys are working on, very cutting edge type projects related to uh, flood forecasting, real time monitoring, things like that, that you can share with everybody? Yeah, so we've got a couple of projects going on right now. Flood forecasting and flood warning has sort of been a passion for me since, I don't know, about 2001. I think I was actually at this conference uh -huh. in Charlotte. Okay. And Tropical Storm Allison moved ashore. During the conference? During the conference. Oh, wow. And uh, I was on the flight back with another colleague of mine, and I'm like, with all this technology, there's got to be something that we can do. And so we started looking into uh, doing some maybe some flood warning or flood forecasting with HMS and HECRAS together. Yeah. And we uh, started working that a little bit, and then we went to talk to our client, the Harris County Flood Control District, about it. And uh, they were intrigued by that idea. And at the same time, at that time, I was with Dodson and Associates. Uh huh. Yep. And at that time, Walter P. Moore and Associates approached them, I think, the same week oh, with really? a similar type idea. Oh, wow. So they put us together, and oh, that really sort of forged the, the bond or that relationship that yeah. we got with them. And then they acquired us in 2012. Oh, okay. But, uh, and it was all because you came to the client with the same idea yeah, within I think, a week. Yeah, I think a lot of that had, wow. had to do with that. And, uh, so what we have tried to do, and, and if you're here at the conference and you, uh, we have a, a, a talk, Christina Hughes and I, on um, Wednesday afternoon. Yeah. I think it's right after lunch. And we're going to be talking about um, that, that there's this idea that not all flood warning systems fit all situations. Right. And so we have been working with a number of clients, and we've, these clients are range from the Harris County Flood Control District that has 188 gauges, and they want to do something really biggest uh, county in the states it is right it, it's yeah. in probably in terms of population yeah probably true. yeah and uh <clears throat> the, the thing that we had built with built for them before was heck raz and heck hms working together yep but what we found is that that was like a 15 minute turnaround time to get a map and it was only two watersheds mm. and they've got 22 watersheds Oof, so yeah like so it kind of sat on the back burner for a little while after we built that um they focused on some other things, putting projects in the ground, things like that. Then they uh, came back to us and said, hey, can you, you guys put some rating curves to, to these 100 plus gauges around the county so that we can measure the flow, not just the stream elevation. Right, right. So we did that. And then they said, well, what else can you do with it? <laughs> and it, it suddenly dawned on us that we could actually probably put this into an HMS model. Uh -huh. We built both of the he the rating curves were from HECRAS. Yep, yeah. Put them into an HMS model and actually get stage hydrographs in real time. Oh wow! So we were able to do that, and uh, we've we've now completed the entire county. It's running through an RTS system that they're working on. We okay. built all the models that are supporting it, and then they're running it in RTS wow. in real time. And it's about it's still about a 15 minute turnaround for the entire county now because we took the RAS portion out of it that's really cool now is the does the public have any um awareness of this or are they able to access this real-time data like say from a website so currently um there's no access from the public i don't know how much the public is aware of it but i do know that the engineering community is aware of it yeah and so they're aware of what we're doing there um some of the the when, when we went and took these ideas to other communities uh they were like well we don't have however much it costs, I think it was like $1.8 million to spend on something like mm -hmm. this. 
um, what else can you do? And we started with the rating curves and we developed a number of algorithms for flash flood areas in another town, another city in North Texas. Oh, wow. And so it actually reacts in real time based on the intensity, the most intense rainfall they've seen in the last six hours. And then through a set of what you and I would call nomographs, yep, yep. <laughs> it's now been computerized. Uh, it is actually looking at that rainfall intensity and projecting an elevation in time. Okay. So if it's only taking the peak of that six hour period, does that mean it's a conservative prediction then? Yeah, it's probably pretty conservative. Okay. And and so, but it's it's been reacting really well. We're, we're just at the point now where we've got enough storms that we can go back and take a look at it and, okay. and get some more information and validate. Yeah. But, but the first couple of tests went really well. And the idea there is you can take that approach and you can apply it to basins or communities that don't have the amount of exactly. revenue that Harris County has. Exactly. Mm. Okay. So we're trying to look at all the whole full range of, of what we can do for various communities, Yep. yep. whether that is doing something like we did for Grand Prairie where it's nomographs, or doing something like Harris County where we're doing yep. full-blown analysis, and then you start bringing in 2D HECRAS, and the faster the computers get, the more this becomes a reality to start bringing that around. Mm, but totally. We're still a little bit far, far away from that because I need... In these areas, I need like 15 to 30 minutes yep. of time, and I yep. don't have that all the yeah. time. So. Yeah, that's really cool. To switch to switch gears on you, Andy, away from Raz just for a second, because we are at ASFPM, which has been yeah. a really, really cool conference this far. What draws you up. personally to ASFPM as a conference? What do you enjoy about coming here? I, I think what, what I enjoy about it is there's this mix of the technical and the application, and that's really where I kind of want to reside. It's like I, I, I am technical and I do like doing running the models and doing all of that, but I also like figuring out how we apply it. I can't just be yeah. academic. I want to make sure that we're actually, uh, you know, interfacing with the communities and helping people. And my son always asked me why I went into engineering, and it was well, I didn't go into it for the money. <laughs> <laughs> I went into it because I, I had this deep seated need to want to be a part of something uh. that's helping the public. That's yeah, really, really neat. That's, that's what I think this conference does. Well, I, what I'm really impressed with is, like you mentioned, the technical. But there's so many HECRAS users here. Yeah. It's, it blows my mind. I, you know, I, this is my first time at this conference. I've been to uh, USSD and ASDSO and more of the damn safety type conferences. Historically, that's what I've done more of. And even at those conferences, there's not that many HECRAS modelers. Yeah. But there's they're all over the place. They've been coming by the booth, wanting T-shirts. So uh, we got somebody getting a t-shirt yeah, right now. Yeah, there you go. Andy's got his t-shirt. So uh, right. we're, our goal is to get, uh, you know, maybe half of this crowd uh, tie dyed there by you the go. end of the week. Yeah. So we'll see. That works. That works. <laughs> well, we really appreciate you coming on, Andy. Before we let you go, is there anything you want to plug about your company, things that are going on, things that are coming up? Uh, well, just I, I think it's it's just exciting to be here, be a part of this, and for our company, you know, Walter P. Moore and Associates, water resources, just a little piece of what we do. But uh, the fact that I can get to hang out with guys like you yeah. and learn from y'all, and uh, and to see our company sort of try to be a little bit more innovative through some of the things that y'all are teaching us, yeah, yeah, uh, is really exciting to me, and and I'm just uh, grateful for the opportunity. Well, I have to reciprocate and say I'm excited to, to hear the things you guys are Amen doing. Amen to that, yeah. Because, you know, we have a fairly, Ben and I, you know, we the company we work for, we have a fairly narrow focus, and, you know, we try to expand as much as we can and we can do with that grass, but there's so many things you can do out there. Yeah, there really and is. To hear what you're doing, it's, well, uh, you. it's really fun to hear. So, thanks, Andy. Appreciate you thanks. joining us. Appreciate and uh, it, Chris. Yeah, we'll thanks, see ben. you around the conference. All right. Thanks so good. much, Andy. Talk to you all later. All right, welcome to Full Momentum and HEC Raz Vodcast, and we have a guest here today, which is very special. Appreciate you <laughs> being on here, Bill Brown, who is with ASFPM. Hey, Bill. Welcome. Good afternoon. <laughs> Good afternoon. <laughs> Bill is a uh, senior project manager with the Flood Science Center, and uh, formerly you had a different role with, with them. Do you want to just talk about that for a second? Uh, I was, at one time, I was the director of the Flood Science Center at ASFPM, uh, actually, I was the original director of the Flood Science Center. I stepped down, some life-changing events, but I uh, still work with them, work as senior project manager, and get consulted a lot by staff about various past perspectives of things. So. And what, what was that role that you had, for those, of you, for those who are not familiar with, with the Flood Science Center, what is the director of the Flood Science Center, what does that, what does that mean? Well, since I was the original one, it was 
trying to set up a vision and direction for the program. Primarily, we do types of research or develop products or resources that can be used by anyone in the flood, anything flood related. We study, evaluate all things flood. It can be social science perspectives, it could be technical perspectives, it could be economic, you name it, how does it link in with other federal programs, move forward with that. But we do, what well, we end up producing a lot of documents, a lot of resources that can be available to the general public, primarily focused on those involved in floodplain management, local officials, uh, engineers, state agencies, and many things we do support the federal agencies. Bill, it sounds like to me you have a very large operation there. How many people work at the Flood Science Center? And um, yeah, I mean, are there some specific project or products you can talk about that people are using today a lot? Well, there's right now there is a staff of eight people. Okay. So it's a, we're pretty diverse in what we deal with. We have a lot of people who are GIS focused. Uh, two of us are engineers. Um, have people with other, various other backgrounds, a lot of just bringing a, a variety of perspectives, environmental, to the table. We're, we struggle to sometimes to find someone involved in social sciences because we'd like to have that aspect sure. of it, you know, but we do have people who have s small background in that endeavor. So, But like I said, the biggest thing for us is to find a variety of people and work through those projects. We, you can check out pretty much anything that we produce if you go to, on the internet. Our site is floodsciencecenter.org. Pretty straightforward, that's who we are. Yeah. But you can go on there and there's a list of our products. We have a, a digital library that's flood related. So if you're looking for any kind of a flood document or anything related to flooding or any, any aspect like that, you can go on there. We link into the worldwide uh, library system using a Koha tool. So. If we don't have it online ourselves to share, it will actually tell you, based upon your IP address, where you could find that resource closest to your locale. And, you know, that way it's a lot easier. So if you're doing a lot of research or trying to get background information, that's a good resource there. Mm -hmm. Some of the products that we have out there that we use, uh, that was some of the things that were highlighted today during the uh, plenary sessions, we have a resource for elected officials basically all things flood so if you have a local elected official and you're like floodplain oh crap what do i do yeah. you know these this is a good resource but it's focused for the elected officials it's yeah. not for the it'll help the floodplain manager it'll help the local guy but it sure. tells them and then we have other resources we have a new tool that will help people try to figure out what mitigation option it works best for their potential problem. Most people, when they need to do some type of flood proofing, they have no clue. They don't know what they're looking for, what, what options are there. We have a real short guided tool that will take you through that. It will also gauge, help you get information for any you know local officials, how you could help also. So these are types of the tools and other things. So I encourage anybody to look on that website and look at the various products that we have available. And if you got a good idea, call us and we'll figure out if there's a way we can do yeah. it. Yeah, I was going to ask uh, exactly that question. What if we had an idea? How does it get funded? How do you guys maintain that operation, keep it going? Is the Flood Science Center is a public It's a public agency, right? We're actually part of ASFPM, the okay. Association of gotcha. yeah. State Floodplain Managers. We <laughs> are strictly funded by whoever we can find to pay for the project. Uh -huh. So okay. we, you think of us as... In, similar to academic researchers mm. we're writing grant proposals we're seeking out it thing we chase whoever we can find to do try to sell the project or the project we have been funded by foundations uh trusts um various organizations we do a lot of work in support of federal agencies so a lot of the federal agencies NOAA, uh fema we've done work for them We've worked in partnerships with organizations like the Pew Charitable Trust. So uh, we, we have a number of entities or, and various foundations that we work with. Have some states have come and asked us for to do assistance. We've worked like the Wisconsin Coastal Organization. So wherever we basically wherever we can chase the money, we that's where we go. Very cool. Well, as you know, Bill, this is you know our vodcast is. 
kind of centered around the use of HEC RAS and that software. Yeah. Now, obviously, it's re very relevant to, f to flooding type of analysis and determination. You shared some stories uh, today with us about your experience using the old HEC2 software. Is there anything in particular you'd like to share as a good story related to that? Because I think there's a lot of folks that would get a kick out of that. I think we were talking earlier is, is you know, HEC's been around for a long time, obviously, yep. but most people don't realize that as far as it on your local computer, your desktop or your laptop or wherever you're using it, that didn't come about until about 1984. So it's still a relatively new tool. And I've never used HEC RAS. I'm old. <laughs> you know, I was HEC 2. And the last project I worked on with HEC 2 was actually to do a LOMAR in the city of Chicago in 1990. Hmm. And what the situation was is that O'Hare Airfield, there was a creek that ran through there. And used to run through there. <laughs> still does. Nah. But the Postal Service needed to expand their air mail facility. They decided the best place to expand it was to move the building towards O'Hare Airport. Unfortunately, there was a creek behind the post office there. They wanted the creek moved from behind the post office to in front of the post office. Mm. So we had to do a design, the firm I worked for at the time, was, was to basically do all the modeling and move the stream from behind the post office to in front of the post office so they could build on top of where the stream was. <laughs> The design considerations were very unique that we had to basically design it so that it wasn't attractive, attractive, attractive to wildlife because it was right near oh, one yeah. of the oh, glide sure. It's not bringing in a bunch of birds to fly uh, in front of the plane. So, it's like the opposite of ESA compliance. Uh, <laughs> so we came up with a very unique design where we still convey the water under extreme events but during normal you know, perennial flow conditions, the base flow the water wasn't visible to wildlife and thus not attractive to that. Mm. And to add fun to the process, we had to get a 404 permit okay. from the Corps, I mean from a, yeah, the Corps of Engineers and EPA. So it added a whole little n nuance to the project. Mm. But Rand did most of the, pretty much all of the HEC 2 analysis for that. But it was, a, it was an interesting process. After that, I kind of got elevated up, changed jobs, and started doing management stuff. So I directed people to do the job and checked over the results, but didn't have to do the modeling anymore. <laughs> okay, good. Um, another question for you. Obviously, you have a plethora of experience being involved with ASFBM at, at, as long as you have been. And so you've been able to see kind of where floodplain management has you know gone over the last 30, 40 years. What do you think, and this is kind of a big question, but what do you think the biggest challenge is for floodplain management in the United States moving forward over the next you know, 10 years? The technology has evolved so fast and so dramatically from the, 19, you know, the 1980s when it was released, when it was still HEC-2, then became hec RAS. But even you know, over the last 10 to 15 years, it went from a steady state to now you know, we moved into dynamic you know, 1D and now we can do 2D analysis. The technology is moving forward. We've got the resources and the ability, the computer power, you know, the, the data. One of the biggest challenges is the rules that we have to abide by and understanding are all still built around the concepts of steady state from pre you know, basically the 1960s. The last time they really updated the FEMA rules was... I think it was sometime in the early 1980s. Mm. If you look at how the technology was then versus what we can do now, it's they have not kept up, and it really requires a whole reevaluation of what how the modeling is applied and taking into consideration many of the things that we do now or have the capabilities to do now. We couldn't touch. We couldn't even dream of doing them mm. in the 1980s. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And. So, you know, most of you who deal with this understand the challenges. If you're running a, a 1D or a 2D model and you have to develop a floodway, <laughs> good luck. <laughs> yeah. And there needs to be, they're still bound to those standards that were established in the original NFIP, the one foot surcharge. Mm. And, if, you know, you've got to realize that was a compromised vision because they didn't have the capabilities to do most of the, that type of modeling when that was developed. I mean, those standards were developed. Uh, adopted by the Water Resource Council in like 1968, somewhere around there. So, how many of you do this design to standards that haven't evolved 
in over 50 years. Right. That doesn't happen and usually in engineering. Yeah, I mean, yeah. everybody else evolves and grows. Yeah. But somehow many of the rules are etched in stone, literally. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, that's one of the biggest challenges. Because one of the, one of the things that FEMA's working on, and I give them full credit upon that, they're trying to, to figure out how to best still meet the requirement because that's the standard in the Code of Federal Regulations. Mm. But how do you do that? and make it reproducible and take a lot of that ability to manipulate and tweak the system and make it, it's gotta be equitable and fair across the board. Yeah, not, not only how do you do that, but how do you transition from how we've done it to how we're going to do it, whatever that looks like, yeah. in a fair way yeah. for people who are in or out of the floodplain and, you know, what does that look like yeah. with the new methodology? Yeah, and, you know, right. one of the things I always talk about, floodway is always one of my favorite things to complain about, <laughs> you know, because in a steady state method, the way they did it. 1D steady state, too, right? Well, yeah. just steady state, period. Yeah. Steady state analysis, you know, the equal encroachment, you know, mm -hmm. that type of stuff. You turn it on, the floodway boundaries established fairly easily. Yeah. And it's, you're going to, pretty much everybody's going to get about the same thing every time you do it. When you move into a dynamic system where you're truly moving dynamically 1D or 2D, I like to point it out, there's infinite floodway solutions. It becomes... Every, every encroachment impacts every other encroachment throughout the system. So yeah. which one dominates, you can actually sort of tweak it and, and that, that may get you what you want for your development or your site, but how does it impact everybody else? Yeah. So how do you, eat that equity aspect, how does that come into play? So that's where things come in. There needs to be some standardized way of getting it so you take that arbitrary aspect. You, you basically lock it in and make it fair and equitable for everyone along the stream system mm -hmm. and still optimize and utilize the, the capabilities that we have available now. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it, those are obviously big challenges, big questions that you're talking about. But I will say that having been here and listened to some folks in the private industry, in the public, you know, public space, as well as FEMA yeah. folks, I do have faith that we are going to be able to, you know, get over the hump because there seems like there's really bright people that have a passion for this and uh, being here and listening to the discussion, you really get a, uh, an understanding of we have very qualified people that are you know, pushing this forward. Yeah, there's oh, yeah. a lot of people who are interested in it, and it is a big issue because guys like you, you're doing this and this is only going to continue to grow. Mm -hmm. I mean, 25 years ago, if you were doing there weren't very many people doing even, you know, unsteady one-dimensional hydraulics. Right. Now it's commonplace. Even even more so, 2D is becoming commonplace. Yeah. And it's just going to continue to grow because the answers and the numbers give a better representation of the risk than what that old HEC-2, or I'll really date myself, TR-20 produced <laughs> <laughs> uh, analysis would do. So as we move forward in time, embrace that new technology, utilize it, and then find a way to integrate it in and, and give the best answer and the best representation of what the risks are out there. Yeah, that's, that's fantastically said. And um, I think it, it really speaks a lot that you've, uh, you came up through all of this from the, you know, the TR-20 days to HEC-2. <laughs> and, and even though you didn't use RAS, but seeing its capabilities and how that can be applied to floodplain and floodway modeling and uh, just a real pleasure having you uh, talk about that with yeah, us. Uh, one last heck thing for you, get a chuckle out of it. <laughs> I went, I, I became, I, one of my, my last public sector job was with the city of Arlington, Texas. And when I went to Arlington, Texas, the studies were actually developed by the Corps back in the early 70s. And one of my favorite things was I had one of the original work maps for the city of Arlington. Yeah. And it had this, basically it was all cotton fields and pasture in this area. And there was a dashed line going across the map. And it says future IH-20. Now, do either one of you know what IH-20 means? Um, Chris would have the best shot. <laughs> IH-20, is that, uh, uh, I was going to say uh, Interstate Highway, but. Interstate Highway 20, which hey. runs on okay. the south side of, yeah. of our Arlington through Dallas, Fort Worth. Nice. That was built in the 70s. So all of the maps in the city of Arlington, Texas, were based upon hydrology and you know surveys and stuff that predate that interstate 20 and now <laughs> you know the city of arlington 
went from you know less than 20,000 people sometime in the 1950s to nearly 360,000 people in and when you look at that, the hydrology is different. Yeah. Just, 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 just a bit, a little yeah, bit more runoff, the, the right? Hydraulics, and yeah. you know that was all based upon the old thing. So when I came in there, one of the things that I wanted to do is I wanted to do watershed plans and update all, all the hydrology and update all the hydraulics. Right. We in, we embraced and we adopted the model that we were going to use. We were using HECRAS. but I was to a degree, and this would have been. 2010, 2011. Okay. Yeah. Uh, right before 2D came out, right? Eh, a few I years before. I was, I was quite radical because the city of Arlington, Texas, all of the flood studies that were done post 2010 were done 1D unsteady. Mm -hmm. Which in, you know, 12 years ago there weren't a lot of people doing it and they let alone a community saying all of our studies are not going to be unsteady yeah. now you know a lot of people do that and it's yeah. a lot it's much more commonplace and they're actually in the final play, final stages of getting some of those maps adopted for fema uh, yeah. but it was you know you know pushing that topic and that concept pushing this envelope so that we move forward and embrace the technology utilize the resources we have so you know what you guys do and what you promote is amazing and it's great and I think, you know, we can take advantage and give a better representation of risk to people. It's not going to be the end all. It's never going to be the exact. It, it, you know, there's always going to be things that change. We know that. But it's an improvement, and we should be embracing that improvement. Yeah. When, uh, for anybody who maybe is doubting the uh, reason or the, one, of the, one of the reasons to join ASFPM and to come to these conferences, having conversations like this with Bill, <laughs> learning the history of kind of how things have happened and, uh, you know, maybe giving us a better idea of where we're going. That's that's a big one. So, again, Absolutely. Bill, really appreciate having you hey, on, thank man. You, yeah. Thank you for you guys being here because, you know, what you do is important and it helps spread what people need to see. So, thanks. Great. Cool. Well, thanks, Bill. Awesome. Good to talk to you. Appreciate <laughs> okay. it. Thanks again, Bill. All right. Welcome to Full Momentum and HEC RAS Vodcast. We have two more folks here that are interviewing with us today on day two of the ASFPM National Conference in Orlando, Florida. Chris, why don't, you, why don't you introduce our special guests today? Our special guests right now are Alexandra Bernard and Robin Williams, and they both work with the Texas Water Development Board in Austin, right? Yeah. And how do you guys like that? How do you like working there? Is it fun? Yeah, I love it. Um, it was my first job out of grad school, and okay. I dove right into the world of flood modeling, and it's been really cool. Are we Aggies or are we I'm a Longhorns? Bobcat. A I'm bobcat. Texas, oh, Texas State. State. Oh, Texas State. Sweet. I got yeah. you. Texas State's <laughs> doing very good in baseball right now. Good. That's yes. great. Because football is. Alexandria, what about you? Uh, is this first first gig out of school? Yeah. Okay. So I'm actually from Boston originally, studied in California, decided, hey, why don't I move to the middle of the, the country? Austin's chose, a good spot to pick. Chose Austin, yeah. Texas. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, we started on the same day, actually, me and Robin. Mm -hmm. So... That's been pretty fun working on the flood modeling team. Very fun. Wow. So, is this your guys' first time at ASFPM? Yeah, we attended the virtual one okay. last year. Cool. Okay. But first what's, in person. What's your impression of the conference overall? It's a lot of fun. A lot of like socializing, mingling. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I feel like with the virtual setting, it was a lot of just only watching presentations and there wasn't as much back and forth. But now you can interact with folks. I feel like talk to people who aren't even presenting. Um, that's been great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Robin, what about you? What are your thoughts on ASFPM so far? The networking has been great. I got to meet you guys. <laughs> <laughs> that was a pleasant surprise. Um, cool. Yeah, and just like being able to network with people from NOAA. I mean, like, I mean, just all these different consulting firms. And yeah, already, you know, met people who are possibly might go to a conference in Seattle. I don't know what Texas Seattle connection, but going to try to make that work but um yeah it's been great the networking has been awesome that's so that's so cool. cool so you guys are both RAS users correct yes cool so is there anything at the conference so far whether it's a t topic that somebody gave a presentation on or just a conversation that you had with somebody that you've learned something about RAS or about how to apply RAS to floodplain management yeah when, well one thing that we just learned we were just talking about um so there are like, you know, sinks in some places. So looking at groundwater interactions, mm, yeah. how do you do that in HECRAS? And I just yeah. listened to a presentation 
where he basically, there was this river where it kind of just like disappeared and there were these sinks and he was trying to model that in Hecraz and what he did is he put inverse hydrographs in the places where there were sinks. Wait, 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 wait. <laughs> What, who, who gave this presentation? Oh, his name was Francisco Pena from wood. With Wood. There we go. Oh. You guys are going to get a kick out of this because yeah. I gave a presentation on like that exact same exactly. topic oh, at no. USSD from a project that we did a number of years ago. So I might have to track I, Francisco I, down and see if yeah. he stole, I, stole I our actually, idea. I actually thought you were pranking us. I just thought you were pranking now, us. I was like, wait, you're going to say yeah. it was Ben. No. Wow, that's incredible. Yeah, well, hey, it just goes to show you that there are a lot of creative yeah. people out there yeah. doing really neat things with Raz. And speaking about learning new things with Raz, you two took our online course, right? At the same same time? Yeah, yeah, we did. Yeah. When was that? That was last year, so spring of what year? 21. 21, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's great. And so how did you find the class? How did you know that it was being offered and, and ultimately signed up? Well, first, we actually had seen your guys' um, podcast videos. Okay. Um, yep. Shouts to the pod. And we used those as resources when we first started, actually, at the agency um, on 2D modeling. Okay. And then we were like, oh, you guys offer a course. Yep. That would be a great experience for our whole team to take advantage of. So we enrolled in the course and did all that. Our plan has worked to perfection. <laughs> yeah, give no. some free material and then, you know. And do you yes. feel like after you took the class, you were able to go back in a project atmosphere and you felt like you were better at Raz afterwards? Yeah. I mean, I think what I like best about the course is you guys talked about the underlying, like, physics and the equations behind it. But, because, I mean, I guess it's kind of weird. I like reading the technical manuals Heck yeah. of Heck Nerd, Raz. Nerd Nation. Nerd. It's great. Um, <laughs> yeah. So... I like that, but I like how you guys made it more accessible. And then once I heard it from you, y'all, like then went back to the technical manual and was like, okay, right. This is what we talked that about makes it. Makes a little more sense. I yeah. was introduced to it. Yeah. So, yeah. What great. about you, Robin? What were your impressions of the class? What did you think about it? Um, I thought it was great. Um, I love the fact that y'all were available for any questions that we had. I think we had like a one-on-one -on -one call with you mm -hmm. when we had some deeper questions. And just like another plug, <laughs> yeah. um, I started reading your blog a little bit, uh -huh. and that's how I found out about your book on oh, Hecras okay. Automation that yeah. we ordered for oh, our did. team as well. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. So you're doing some automation now? Not yet getting there, but we have your book in the office ready oh, okay. to open up whenever we well, have If you ever time. want free IT support on I'm Eddie Raz, just cr tell Chris you bought his book <laughs> and that you're doing it. He'll get so fired up, he might fly to Texas and help you out. Yeah, that's, wow. that's about, about wow. accurate. Yeah, well, that's really cool. Yeah, I'm glad you bought that, and I hope it really works for you guys because it's a really powerful tool that nobody, not a lot of people know about. Mm -hmm. Looking so, forward to using it for sure. Good. Well, anytime you got questions. Ben is there for you. <laughs> I'm kidding. Exactly. I was going to say, Alexandra, I can tell that you're officially Texan now. Because I know you said you were from Boston, went to California, and I just heard a y'all. I guess. So you, you're integrated, I think, I to, guess so. to Texas. I used to so. say y'all, but I didn't realize that was like a, a Texas thing. But have, so. you, have you graduated to all y'all yet? Because that's a more advanced all version of that. Yeah, that's, all y'all. That's, that's like varsity Texas. So. Yeah, that's oh advanced. I think I would say all you guys. All yeah, the, yeah, yeah. You got to work up to it yeah. slowly. Yeah, that's true. Robin's there, I can tell. <laughs> yeah, but definitely. yeah, you don't yeah. just jump into Texas and go right to the all y'all. I'll, yeah. I'll work on it, Robin. I'll make you proud. <laughs> well, it was super, super fun yeah. visiting with you guys. Thank you so much for coming by, being willing to jump on the, the podcast. Yeah. yeah. Um, I would like to say this is your your big moment of fame, but in reality, you know, this is this is your opportunity to talk to Raz Nation, which you yeah. know is a growing community. It is probably it not going to make it's any money, community. but. It's a uh, it's a cool opportunity, and we love hearing stories about you know younger engineers. You guys are both engineers, right? Mm -hmm. Coming in, learning Raz, taking your Raz game to the next level, and then coming to a conference like this and really maybe even growing your vision for what can what Raz can do and what you guys can do as engineers even further. So. Yeah, thanks you guys. Yeah. This was a lot Thank of fun. Thank you both. Yeah. All right, enjoy the rest of your conference. Thank yeah. You. Cheers. Okay.